Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you th thanks once again for the opportunity and the privilege to be together to reflect on your word and to seek to discern your will for our lives and to look for the purpose and meaning for how we can best serve you and reach out to others. So bless our time together and our sharing and our reflection together. We give you all of these things in your gracious name. Amen. So today, we're going to look at chapters 7 and 8 of Ecclesiastes, and we're going to look at uh, chapters 6 and 7 of uh, Rabbi Kushner's book, When Everything You've Always Wanted in Life Isn't Enough. And so um, as we begin, I'm going to open it up. Any comments uh, or um, statements anybody has in terms of what you read or saw this week before I start asking you questions? Anybody? No takers? Well, a couple things in terms of chapter seven. As you look down, um, I was struck in, in chapter seven, as you move down, where he says um, in verse 18, um, verse uh, actually 17 and 18, don't be too wicked, don't be too good, avoid extremes, sort of live in between, live, live the mean. And when I saw that, I was struck um, right between the eyes. It sounds a lot like um, Aristotle in terms of uh, development of virtue and the influence there. Um, so depending on what translation you're reading, is that don't be dumbfounded and don't try to be too good or too bad. And then we'll say the little, there'll be a little bit of both, but he says just avoid extremes and, and don't try to be um, one or the other, just stay down the middle. And I, I just was really struck by the fact that that really is the Aristotelian um, model for how you develop virtue. Anybody catch that? And yeah, the golden mean. That's right. That's exactly what that is. I thought, mm, that's, that's sort of fascinating to catch that. And the first part of seven are really just short little proverbs that he sort of lays out there, many of which are, are um, sort of famous when you, when you read them. And, it, and the first page of the quotes I sort of pulled out from Kushner's book, uh, and the, in the middle of them, uh, one is a question I raise, um, what are the limits of human reason in trying to discern the purpose and meaning of life? Is there something more required in our effort to figure out what life is all about? Um, how did you respond to that? I'll comment on that, Chuck. Uh, sure. Uh, I did think about that. And one of the things that was pretty obvious to me is as you're developing your reflection, you haven't been through your whole life yet. So how do you do that? Because there's some of it still left. And if you look at the development of wisdom uh, in your life, it comes through life's experiences and there are experiences that you haven't had yet that might change the way you look at things. I think you can develop some of it, but uh, it might not be a finished product. I guess perhaps when you're on a deathbed or something like that, it might be finished, but uh, it takes a <laughs> while. Yeah. It yeah. takes a while to do that. Yeah. So you better be careful what you think's going on, particularly if you're young, because you haven't, you know, as you get older, you've had more experiences. As you're young, you haven't had any, you have the intelligence then, but you really don't know what to do with it in many cases. So I think that's a problem that uh, you would have in, in doing, uh, you know, trying to reflect on your life. It's not over yet. 
Well, and it sort of ties in with the top of two where I, and uh, Martin, you sort of commented on this uh, almost like it was our first class is that um, just because somebody's smart has a lot of knowledge, does that make them wise? Um, and I've known a lot of brilliant, brilliant, smart people in life who do some of the stupidest things. I mean, they just aren't very wise. Um, they don't have a lot of practical wisdom. Um, and it's one of those kind of things, how can really bright, intelligent people not have common sense, not be wise? And how in the world do you distinguish that? Um, and so the question then becomes, you know, how far does reason take you? And I think you use the word experience. And is there a distinction between the two? Uh, where do they come together? That's, that's sort of an interesting kind of a, of a dilemma that um, I'm wondering if there's a disconnect with Coalith. Right. Well, he, beco he becomes a philosopher. I mean, and we use that term a lot. And you have the same problem as a philosopher in trying to put things together using logic and reasoning. Uh, you might not be able to do that entirely because you haven't had the, the total experience yet. Uh, this is, you know, you can string stuff together. That's interesting how the philosophers take something and then try and project it outward with no data. Um, you get into trouble when you start to extrapolate if you don't know what's coming. I mean, you can guess at it, but you might not always be right. You don't know when there's going to be an inflection point in the curve. And there can, a lot of things can happen when the curve starts to lean over. And if you didn't anticipate that, you just missed it. Good point. I, I view sort of the, the reason being me being able to figure out everything on my own. Experience, uh -huh. experience dealing with other people uh, gives you, gives you the relationships, give, I think, bring something to reason and I'll give a different point of it. I see very bright people get in trouble when they don't listen to anybody else, when they figure uh, out all the answers, you know, when they're surrounded by yes men. And yeah. so I, one of the things in Ecclesiastes you see is, is a guy struggling to figure out everything by himself. Good insight. That's an excellent insight, Scott. I think that's, that's a fascinating point. And I think talk about the, bringing that into real life. How many people you know try to figure it out all themselves and, and refuse to listen to folks who can bring tremendous insight and help them if they would just receive insight from other people, but refuse to because they want to do it on their own, mm -hmm. or at least claim to do it on their own. Um, sort of that's a great insight um, in terms of connecting with people and being open to feedback or input from others. <laughs> I think it's really sort of a fascinating thing to keep in mind because essentially, Cole has said that from the very beginning. I try to understand everything there is and experience everything there is on his own. And we really haven't seen him or heard him or talk about receiving input from the outside sources or relationships. At least he hasn't talked about that, um, which is sort of fascinating. Don't you think one thing, Chuck, that, uh, you know, these philosophers, a lot of them can have general principles such as Kant's categorical imperative, which is Jesus's golden rule, basically. So mm -hmm. that's a good general uh, principle to start with. So there are some things that you can start with to try and live a good life, but it, it might take more than just that. But if you take a proposition like do unto others that you would have to do unto you, that's a pretty good general proposition, don't you think? If you, yes, it is. Yeah, if you start to measure things based on that particular idea. 
So you can start out, it might not be the complete one yet, but uh, you might be able to, to work from that one with, with not as much risk, actually. Actually, the, that whole, I think, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, there's a parallel in almost every world religion with that particular principle. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 and a lot of and you say, too. A yeah, of, and you have to say- They just think that, different ways. Yeah, is, is that um, coincidence or is that worked out because it makes sense? It, it works. I mean, it's something that it's a principle that is, is tried and true um, if you put it into practice. Were, were any of you struck by um, Kushner's sharing when he was um, in seminary about being a rationalist versus a mystic, uh, dividing in the two camps. Yeah. Um, and I, I just sort of laughed because I get it, you know, the, the rationalist, if you just explain, now catch what he said, explain tradition. For the Jews, tradition is very, very important. You explain the tradition, idea of, of whole idea with their minds, something you can understand. If you can explain that and understand it, people will accept religion. Now, in the reform tradition, for the Calvinists, that's right up their alley. You can explain the tradition, lay it out so people understand what religion and the creeds are all about. They'll be able to accept it. And then there are the mystics. And let me say that the Eastern traditions are more into that, basically with their souls, something that can never be understood or explained, only experienced. And, and, and you know folks who are, are sort of in that camp that, that they're not worried about the rational explanation, but the idea of the experience of religion. And it's sort of interesting. Sometimes you know, folks need to understand everything and you wanna say, you know, there's some things you just can't explain You've just got to experience it and there's no explanation for it. Those people are driven nuts when you can't explain something. And yet there are some things in life you can't explain. It's just something you have to sort of go with the flow and experience. Do you, did you get what he was saying there? Yeah, Chuck, definitely, it definitely affected me and um, I would say I was a rationalist or am partly a rationalist, but then something dramatic happened to me. And that dramatic thing was Will Wellman. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that was bad. <laughs> a bad thing happened all to right, you, Will. <laughs> all, it's been all downhill ever since. Yeah, so he's, right. he's taken me there and I'm <laughs> loving it. And now I'm over with that Buddhist Richard Rohr. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you know, it's Will. And, and okay. know what Kushner said early on in his life, he was on the rationalist side. And as he got older and experienced life, he realized that there are some things you just have to accept and, and, and appreciates more the mystical side um not that and, and no he says there are some things you certainly want to try and explain everything that you can but then at some point you just have to accept what you can't and i thought that really it we would, would all probably be a lot better off if if we could we could appreciate the experiential and the mystical side, which is part of the religious part. Um, and, and what struck me was that we are all, whether we want to admit it or not, heirs of the enlightenment, where we, we really fall into the trap of coalesce where we want to try to understand and explain everything. And yet that really is not possible. I mean, it, it our, our world is too big, God is too great, and the human ability to try and grasp it all is too small. I mean, 
you can only go so far. Chuck. And so the ability to be able to appreciate that, I think is important. Chuck. Chuck. Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, when I was in seminary, one of my professors uh, was not a rationalist or a mystic, but he was sacramental. And I think that's an option mm. that's kind of in between. And we as Protestants maybe don't get into that. But if we had a Roman Catholic here taking this class, that person would say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you can't ignore the sacramental uh, way of understanding religion or experiencing God, where uh, it's not mm -hmm. simply an intellectual thing or a mystical thing where I, I am off trying to commune directly with God, but it's through physical signs and seals that I drink or I eat, that, that there's a uh, almost a miraculous sacramental experience of God or God enters into the congregation of the faithful as they come forward to take the bread and the wine. And that's always made an impression on me because I grew up in a very rational Calvinistic church. And uh, when I went to seminary, uh, for the first time, I confronted a professor who was extremely sacramental in his theology. That was totally new for me. And I had to really wrestle with that. And, um, and finally concluded that I was really impoverished by not being exposed to uh, Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox uh, doctrine and theology. Uh, just my Calvinistic roots limited me. Sure, absolutely. And in the sacramental, for that to have meaning, it has a mystical bent. Uh, I agree. For, yeah. Yeah, and rational. Uh, and so you look, oh. yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. And so you look at that and go, hmm. And I think there's power to that. Uh, and, and I think you're absolutely right, Rob. That's one of the things that provides a whole new dimension of how one experiences the sacred. Um, that sometimes we miss that. Uh, and I, I often wonder why is it that we in the reform branch are afraid of it? And my conclusion is it's because we can't control it. Mm -hmm. um, that really is, and it's a whole control issue. Um, yeah. It isn't life about yeah. a control yeah. issue. Yeah, um, Chuck, uh, just, just the idea of controlling the sacramental. I remember uh, the debates in the session at uh, uh, the church, Palm Grove Presbyterian Church, where I was pastor for 12 years. The, some of the biggest issues on session was who could partake of the Lord's Supper and who could be baptized. Uh, again, the idea of the, the elders uh, in the session felt the need they had to control these sacraments. <laughs> and they were very concerned about my language. In fact, we had to write it out uh, and it had to be approved by the session because uh, they said, hey, you just can't offer the bread to everybody and you just can't <laughs> baptize anybody. You can't do that. <laughs> And I tell you, I, I spent quite some nights uh, going through those meetings and, and having to deal with how do you make sense of this? <laughs> well, and, and, you know, it's really interesting as you look at um, chapter, the next chapter, you know, who's afraid of the fear of God, chapter seven, and, and coalists struggle with religion. And how um, basically he's disappointed in religion and look at how Kushner talks about what we look for in religion and whether our expectations and our expectations of God are met. And I know whether you look through those statements and you look about expectations and what we're looking for. And particularly if you look on page four, um, what, whether our religion and our expectations of church have been met and why or why not? Is it our expectations of God or is it what we expect that are this problem? Um, 
And I've often wondered, as I look at people and say, my church let me down. Uh, it didn't come through when I wanted it to. And I thought, well, without getting into a debate, usually, not that the church isn't at fault or hasn't let somebody down, but what is, a, what is it we expect of God or the church? And are our expectations realistic? When you look at people, what do we expect of God? Um, because if you look at what he's saying in, in part of, of chapter eight, you know, people who are wicked get um, honorable burials. People who are righteous get overlooked. And he says it's all senseless and doesn't make sense. Religion isn't what it should be. And it's sort of fascinating to look at Krishna's take on that. Um, this is one of those areas where they sort of do coincide here that um, the religion of Koala's day isn't necessarily what he's looking at. And at least Kushner's take is religion can make you obedient and provide a certain way in which to, to look at life rather than giving you an authentic person. Um, how did you respond to that? Chuck, I have a comment on that. Don't we see as Coralith goes through the books of Ecclesiastes that what he's figuring out is you can't reason your way to success in the end. Right. I believe you see a change in that. In the front end, it's one way. And then in the back, there's sort of an intermediate part of it that's, oh, I don't know what's going on here. And then toward the end, he sort of figures out, well, reasoning is not going to get me there. That's what it was. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're yeah. right. And at some and that, say that's what you're talking about in terms of expectations. You develop expectations through reason, but it's not working for you uh, because no. you have a mystical component that uh, you can't reason that out. No, you uh, can't. And, and I, Martin, I think you picked up something very important there. A lot of people would say, hey, wait a minute, he's being inconsistent, but I think you hit on okay. it. He is really reflecting on his different experiences that has led him sort of to different conclusions along the way. Um, and I think your comments right on in terms of where he's ending up with a conclusion that you just cannot come to any kind of rational consistency. It doesn't lead you there. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a reaction to that? Yeah, Chuck? Yes. As I, as I read this chapter uh, and uh, made a lot of notes in the margins here, it struck me that I, I think he is dealing with a, a very narrow and restricted definition of religion. Uh, seeing it as kind of a legalistic way. And uh, one of my favorite writers is Luke Timothy Johnson, who right. went to Princeton and then taught at Yale. And I, it is a really, really good uh, grasp of what is human religion. And for, for John, Luke Johnson, he has religion. Uh, he's analyzed it in what do we get or expect from religion, and he doesn't limit it to just one thing, but uh, he's got four major things that we as human beings get from religion or use religion for, and I thought that that concept was much broader and had much more depth than what I was reading in Kushner. I just thought he was too limited and narrow in his use of that word. Okay, that's good. Good insight. Appreciate that. I have a question. Um, about half of the people on this meeting are pastors, and I assume, <laughs> yes, maybe, uh, correctly, maybe that they have made you have made religion the cornerstone of your life. So, the question is to you. Um, did you find satisfaction in making religion the cornerstone of your life? Good question. 
<laughs> if if <clears throat> I were if I were honest, um, my religion in terms of um, being important to me would say the same. I don't know whether I would choose the ministry as my vocation if I did it again, if I were going back and starting over again, to be honest with you. I well, think I can make a greater okay. impact doing other things. And both in here. Uh, Chuck, if it makes you feel any better, with the lighting there, you have a halo around your head. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you'll make you'll make it yet, Chuck. <laughs> the, but you know, it's it seems to me we we read Job a few weeks or months or years ago. I don't know what what it was, and this COVID strikes me as something that Job's uh, friends would have written, the one who were trying to critique his yeah. life might have written if they had uh, been poets, because this guy or woman or whatever it is that wrote this has a, a powerful way of expressing himself in a poetic fashion. And I think that they account for why people, uh, you know, memorized this and reported it uh, without really looking to see whether or not as a whole, the whole thing made any sense. And to me, it seems like there's a couple of things that despite the fact that I enjoy reading it, and I'm glad he wrote it and they glad they had the integrity to preserve it. He misses the point. And if, if somebody asked me, why are we here? I would say it's to take care of one another. Mm. And he doesn't <laughs> yeah, good point. think about that. Uh, and the other thing is, is he describes the ends that he has met, but we are inculcated with kind of a Gandhian uh, and many other uh, traditions is that it isn't the ends, it's the means that count. And we don't know what his means were for his success. If, if the means are the end, which is what Gandhi said, then every day that you exercise the proper means and try to take care of one another, <laughs> then you'd have had a meaningful life. You don't have to worry about how how it ends up. Um, but um, that's just some fragmentary thoughts that. Uh, but I think well, well stated. I appreciate that very, very much. And that's a good point. Uh, Chuck. <clears throat> yes. Back to Robert Mims question. I never thought of myself as what was the word you use making religion the cornerstone of my life um i went to my 60s not about my other colleagues here but while we didn't use the labels rationalist and mystic uh we had camps you know progressive evangelical those who put much more emphasis on the intellectual content of faith and those who we even had some students who spoke in tongues. Um, so we, we had those divisions. And for a number of reasons, uh, I was a couple of weeks away from graduating from seminary, still wondering where I was going next. And one afternoon in the library, I just had this overwhelming sense of, did I make the wrong choice? Uh, <laughs> there was This was in the midst of all the uh debate over integration none of the students that i was aware of were opposed to integration the what divided us was is it the church's business to get into politics and add you know well, there were those that yeah, segregation needs to end but the, it's not the church's issue and others of us were marching in demonstrations so uh, 
and I thought, here we are supposed to be modeling the love of God, and we are at each other's throats in many ways. And you talk about a mystical experience. I was flipping through the Bible, and I came to First Thessalonians and just idly started reading it. And I came to chapter 2, verse 8, which says in part, we are eager to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. And I, I, I was captured by that and made it the theme of my life and ministry that I thought to myself, I'm not going to get all wrapped up in all this um, minutia of what all you have to do and all the hoops you have to jump through to be ordained as a Christian minister. But what my life is about is seeking to share the gospel. And I think this goes, Ed, to your point about caring for each other, the sharing <laughs> myself with others uh, is a two-way street. So that's how I would frame it, uh, Robert Mims. Um, and I, 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 maybe I'm echoing what Chuck was saying earlier. The older I got and the more I was a minister, the less enamored with ordination and all those structures I became. <laughs> <laughs> all those traditional structures. Good point. Uh. Well, and I've said this before on other situations. I, I, I went with the press meeting where we voted to ordain Will. Uh, and his was an example of, often those ordination exams were an example of the camps, the walls, the, uh, the as you were saying, uh, Robert Waringa, the, the putting up walls. And if you don't have my understanding of propositional truth, I'm going to vote against your ordination. Uh, those were almost never high moments in my career in Presbyteries. And, and one other thing, I looked it up. Um, I think it's a little different in Deuteronomy, but this well-known quote, this happens to be from Luke uh, 10. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That is, it's uh, my whole self, not just my spirit, and my neighbor, back to Ed's point. Mm. It's both mm. and. It, it's, it's that interior life that equips me to serve others. Well said. Well said. Absolutely. Question. No one's touched the um, most controversial part of this entire book yet. Um, basically looking at um, verses 25, 26, 27 about um, the woman who is deceptive. Um, <laughs> how did you all uh, respond to uh, CLCL's uh, take on that <laughs> well personally i'm glad for you to walk across that bed of coals chuck <laughs> <laughs> well i think seattle's explanation was outstanding I, okay. I really was impressed with that matter of fact he's the only one that hit it head on and i think gave the most reasonable um explanation of that Anyone else respond to that? Ed? Because this is this is a, one of the toughest spots in the entire Hebrew Bible. Well, I don't find it a tough spot at all because um, he uh, said shortly before that only one in a thousand men uh, seem to meet his standard. And I think it's a sampling error. He, uh, uh, he has an underpowered study here. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's looking for that one woman who's only found one in a thousand men. So I, I think he's, 
uh, in his uh, statistics, he has run into a, a barrier here and he can't <laughs> sign any credence to it. Well, and, and, if you, and if you look at verse 20, it says, not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Not a single one. And as Seattle says, um, you look at the feminine, that it's in, in terms of uh, with the definite article, it's not looking at any specific woman or, or woman in general. It's really metaphorical. And basically folly is in um, the feminine. Wisdom is in the feminine. It's metaphorical, trying to compare one versus the other. Um, and I think that really does make sense um, when you look at that, particularly when we get to next week and you look at verses um, seven through 10 and nine, where it, and that's gonna be my question at the end of our time together, for him, is that the resolution and the answer for looking for the purpose in life? Um, so to be consistent, is it really a, a, a drawn out metaphor trying to understand wisdom versus folly rather than an attack on womanhood in general? Chuck? And I think that really is the best explanation that I came across that, that really Seattle um, was able to explain, Chuck? looking at the early Greek translators and interpreters. Chuck? Chuck? Yes. Uh Yes. When I, when I read that uh, in uh, the my Bible here, uh, I see it as just reflecting the culture in which he wrote, and uh, I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, you live in a certain, Paul's the same way. You live in a certain culture. These books are part of that culture, and I don't think they're apart from the culture. I don't think that they dropped from heaven which is what the muslims think of the quran that it just dropped from heaven perfect i i don't think that's a jewish or christian understanding of revelation these books are human documents as well as divine documents and for me i said well okay in that day there was a, a very negative view toward women and you find it all through the ancient world if you read aristotle some of the things he says about women and how little ability they have, uh, it's the same thing. You know, in the Greek world, the Roman world, the Jewish world, that's how slaves were viewed. That's how foreigners were viewed. That's how women were viewed. And I think for me, I don't have to update this passage. I can accept it as saying, okay. yeah, this guy wrote it in a certain time frame. And uh, I no longer accept that in the 21st century, but I realize, yeah, sure. he, he was uh, that. When I was a child, my, my father was on the session as an elder, uh, but my mother could not be. And this is in the right. 20th century. And so uh, if I wanted to push that, I could say, well, wait a minute, you know, how come my mother cannot be on the session? Yeah. Well, because of right. the traditions of the 1960s, the 1970s, it wasn't until the 1990s that my home church would say, yeah, we can take your mother on the session. So to me, I see it the same way. And I think the only real problem is if you are a literalist, if you are mm. a Christian fundamentalist, then you have problems with this because right. you didn't allow space for the culture of that time. At least that, that's my point of view on it, Chuck. How about this? Here's a <clears throat> second temple guy writing, as uh, Robert um, just mentioned, uh, the culture of his day. In the 21st century, only men are allowed to go to the Western Wall together. Ah, good point. 24 centuries later, it's still that way. Yeah. There. Good point. The women do get to go to the wall in a different spot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting point, Robert. Thank you. I, I like uh, Seattle's interpretation of this. And I actually just 
was looking through, I've got the Harper call and study Bible, the NRSV. And they say in regards to verse 26, some read this as a polemic against women. More likely it echoes Proverbs warnings against the seductiveness of folly and adultery in which males are responsible for sexual restraint toward women other than their wives. And so I think that kind of echoes what Seattle was getting at that this is more about folly than about women and something Chuck and I spoke about, you know, if you jump to chapter nine, verse nine, it says, enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in toil at which you toil under the sun. And, and so I don't, I, I just don't see it as like a across the board polemic against wom- women as much as a discussion of folly. And we're not picking up on that because the English translation doesn't echo it as clearly as the Hebrew. But plus if, if tradition holds and Solomon wrote this and Solomon wrote song of songs, <laughs> you know, <Hey. laughs> I mean, I don't have to more than that. Yeah. Chuck, I've got a comment on this one. Do you know what Hemingway said? He said uh, that he was deciding, telling somebody how he felt, whether an act was moral, good, or bad. He said, after you do it, if you feel good about it, it wasn't bad. (laughs) That's sort of, I I had to laugh at that one. That's sort of self-serving. Only Ernest. (laughs) Yeah, good old Ernest, yeah. Uh, (laughs) Was he president? (laughs) If it feels good, it wasn't bad. Well, hey, this, um, that's one go. way of looking at it. <laughs> well, after it's done, it wasn't bad. <laughs> Hemingway's uh, golden. Very fascinating. Uh, any other comments about either uh, Coalith or Krishna's take on life in chapter seven and eight? No, I'll do it back. Six and seven, I mean, pardon me. Anybody pick up on his uh, comment about the Yiddish word mensch? I really like that comment. Yep. Yep. Page five, Do you think Coalith uh, fulfills the comment of Mensch? Maybe. <clears throat> Go forth into an uncharted world where you have never been before. Struggle to find your path, but no matter what happens, know that I will be with you. That spoke to me. I think Very good. End, I think in the end, he might have figured that out or might have been one. It's cold if, as he was reasoning through. Okay. thought that was an interesting um, term that he brings in there um, in terms of what we try to become in terms of a, an authentic person and have integrity. That's the bottom of page 134 in the book. Yeah. The whole discussion. I, I tend to be on the side of Ed, Ed uh, and think that Koaleth is, 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 he has a my, kind of a myopic, selfish outlook. And um, he's the, the, the perfect spokesperson for the 21st century American, you know, that's just concerned about themselves and their issues and their problems. Um, and that's why I t- tend to lean more towards the prophetic tradition that that speaks about the issues of the community and not the individual. And so I would say he's not a mensch. Okay. <clears throat> I would tend to agree with you, Will, that um, he he does not really fulfill the characteristics that are described by Cushman because he doesn't care about it. Like, and, and so that, in terms of concluding our time together, my question would be, 
as you look at chapters 9 and 10 next week, to focus particularly on 9, 7 to 10, and ask yourself the question, is that really the resolution and the answer for Coalus in his search? That's the extended refrain. Now we have seen that mentioned throughout in different sections of the, of the book. This is the expanded version. So my question is, is this really the answer for him? And if it is, it certainly doesn't meet Ed's criteria for the meaning in life, caring for others. <clears throat> it really seems introverted and self-focused. But everything we've read so far, <clears throat> it's not finished yet because we have, still have 11 and 12 to do. Is this, at least as far as you can tell, is this his answer? Um, I don't know how the final say on this thing, but I want you to ask yourself that question. If you're reading through this book and somebody says, all right, he says he wants to find out the meaning in life. If I read through this whole thing, Job struggles with his question in his book. Show me the answer. Is this where you point? Is this, is this it? And if that's the resolution, you're going to say, but Peggy Lee, is that all there is? Then let's keep dancing. I mean, it's, 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 is this it? Um, and I think it's an important question to struggle with. And I'll leave you with that as the thing to really ask ourselves as we go into next week. Does that make sense? Yep. Other comments or, uh, to close with? Scott, would you close this with prayer? Are you Heavenly still with Father. us? Yes, I'm, I'm just shifting off mute. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to discuss your word, to discuss where it calls us. We ask you to watch over us as we go out to this week, doing our best to do unto others as we would have them do unto ourselves. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Y'all have a great week. You too.